So, um, I'm assuming. Um, not everyone here wants to learn about PHDL, uh, which is a good thing to learn because it allows you to program FPGAs. It also allows you to simulate uh, digital circuits um, more effectively instead of having to use some kind of graphic interface and, and, and write out your, your circuit using a schematic. You can just write it. Um, a lot more more quickly in BHDL. Um, so a little background on hardware description languages. Uh, the, the two main ones that everyone uses uh, are Verilog and BHDL. Um, I think most classes here are taught using examples in Verilog. Uh, they, they both originated and came into wide usage during the 80s. Uh, VHDL actually began as a documentation language for the US Army. Uh, there were custom ASICs being built for uh, by military contractors, etc. And they needed a way to document exactly what hardware was on each chip. And Verilog was not acceptable because it wasn't strongly enough typed. So here we developed a, a VHDL, which is a, is a very strongly typed language with syntax that's very similar to ADA, um, or ADA. Um, and um, so that separates a little bit from Verilog, which was originally intended as a simulation language. Uh, VHDL in its history was meant to correspond to actual physical hardware. Um, in the early 90s, when uh, Xilinx became uh, well known, popular, people started buying FPGAs to prototype and as patch boards for. Um, making connections on a very complex circuit board. Uh, initially, they used a, a graphic interface where you just drag, drag wires in between pins. Uh, and then they realized that once people wanted to start doing more complex things with FPGAs and started to use FPGAs as prototypes for uh, custom, uh, custom chips, uh, it was necessary to have a more effective way of inputting uh, what kind of circuit you wanted. So uh, that, that was really when, when Verilog and VHDL became much more widespread because they were the easiest way to design for FPGAs and ASICs. Um, just a note, uh, the latest uh, version of VHDL is 2008. However, most synthesis tools still use the 1993. Uh, version or sometimes the 2000 version. So you just have to be careful with that um, because if you learn a lot of the 2008 syntax, you'll find that you can't actually use it for anything yet. So, um, so here's a little bit of the basic structure of VHDL. Um, you see, uh, if you're familiar with Verilog, you know you don't really have libraries and packages, whereas uh, in VHDL, um, uh, the, the basic library that everyone uses is just the IEEE standardized packages. Uh, you have to be kind of careful with this because um, certain packages are actually standardized by IEEE. Uh, other ones are proprietary, differ from manufacturer to manufacturer of the synthesis tool. So it's better not to use um, <coughs> the non-standard packages because they may not work the same in different software. Um, so this is a standard package. That's the only one that I'm actually using in this non-example. But um, this, this package is very commonly used because it's useful, but 
you can get in trouble with it because you don't know exactly how it's going to behave. Um, so at the beginning of any VHDL code, you always have to you know, say what packages you want to use. Um, and now the the uh, the largest I guess construct in most VHDL that returns the top level is uh, the entity. Um, and uh, basically what an entity does is it declares a black box. So basically what this is saying is I want some component, just don't know what's inside it, and I know that it has two inputs and one output with Um, in an output bus, which basically means just a lot of wires, and it's more convenient than individually writing out all the outputs. So this might be a little bit confusing because this may this may look similar to the syntax to um, define an array um, in some other programming languages. Uh, but really, all this means is that um, you have eight bits. Um, coming out, and you want to just tie them all together because they're related. Um, and you also notice that for any construct in, in VHDL, you have a very symmetrical uh, um, boundaries on that. Uh, it's kind of verbose, but um, it's very easy to read. So. Um, also notice uh, <coughs> inputs, I have to give it a type. Uh, most synthesis tools will only accept uh, the standard logic type as your input or output. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, so that, that, that gives me a black box um, that I can use. Now, if I actually want to do anything with this, if I want to define any behavior, uh, I need to have what's called an architecture. Uh, an architecture defines the, the, ins the internals of whatever you're designing uh, to put inside your entity. You can have multiple architectures for one entity. Um, so in this case, I, I, I say architecture, cool stuff of example. Uh, this means the architecture's name is cool stuff, the entity is example. Um, so <clears throat> each architecture must correspond to only one entity, but one entity can have many possible architectures that can go inside it, uh, depending on how you instantiate it. Um, so up here you just declare constants and signals. There's good references for, for what to put where. And then within this, this, this architecture, you pretty much pretty much put everything that all the functions, uh, all, all, all the functionality that, that, that you want out of um, whatever you're designing. Um, so here's an example of what's called structural architecture. Um, if you're building a top level, like a black, a black box like, um, like this, um, Generally, you'll have many sublayers, and a structural uh, style of architecture is basically just taking several sublevels and tying them together. So, you see, I have um, I defined inputs and outputs for my entity, um, but I also have some signals. Signals are um, basically internal connectors between uh, blocks when, when they're used in a structural uh, style architecture. It's ba uh, basically, in this case, a signal is just a wire. So all I have is I have a Basically saying, so I have three stages, 
and each of them is clocked. <coughs> And uh, I also have a bus that's going from one to the other. And you, and you can see I, I just have a separate instantiation for each of these uh, sublevels. Um, so each of these is actually an, an, a separate entity in architecture pair. Um, so here I say working directory uh, entity called thing with an architecture called RTL. So um, that, that gives me, that, that tells me uh, which entity an architecture to use. And then I have this where I'm just tying my signals and inputs to this architecture <coughs> into the, uh, basically the, the interface for my sub, my sub layer. Um, so each of these is its own entity and architecture and it's inside of a larger uh, off layer. So that's if I want to tie sublevels together. But if I actually want to simulate behavior uh, or, sim or synthesize some, some kind of uh, circuit behavior, um, I need to use what's called the behavioral architecture. Um, behavioral architecture uh, has to be done in a different style depending on whether you're intending to whether you're designing to, syn to synthesize on an FPGA uh, or an ASIC, or whether you want, or alternatively, if you want to simply simulate a design, see how it works. Uh, so, most of the syntax for VHDL only works in simulation. Uh, only about 30% of the syntax actually works in a synthesis setting. So you have to be aware of that and be very careful when you're reading a, a reference guide for VHDL that you, you understand uh, what's synthesizable and what's not. And when you're writing behavioral uh, VHDL, you have to be cognizant of what hardware you're uh, designing for if you're designing for synthesis. So, the most common example now is an FPGA. Like, this is just a blow up of, of the, uh, the same FPGA that, that's on this board. Um, and it's basically many, many small, uh, uh, what are called logic units tied together, and you can rearrange them. Uh, you can redo the connections by reprogramming their lookup tables uh, to basically form a custom circuit on the FPGA that is completely reprogram re reprogrammable. Um, so this is the basic unit of a Cyclone 4, Altera Cyclone 4 uh, FPGA. Um, so as you can see, you have a carry chain and a lookup table. Uh, this is how it's programmed. It's, uh, basically, all the program data is just shift, shifted in, uh, into the FPGA. Um, so basically, you have a clock with a clock enable. You have a register, and you have combination logic. And then you have routing that connects logic units together within the FPGA. So you have to be cognizant of the fact that you have a limited number of inputs into each logic element. And you have a register, but you don't have a latch. So you have to be designing for registers. You shouldn't be trying to rely on latches a whole lot because there really isn't one to use. You have to simulate its behavior, and that doesn't necessarily work out that well. <coughs> So, and you, here's the, uh, the fabric. Is the, the so you can see I have a few PLLs I can use um, for for clocks. Uh, there's memory distributed throughout the throughout the device. Um, lots of MK9 blocks and, or M9K. Wow, M9K. Uh, so. Various, various random blocks that I can use. Um, 
So here's some general rules for, for synthesis, and, I, and I, these will make sense more in a minute when I switch to showing you uh, an actual HDL program. Uh, try to avoid programming in a way that will result in latches, because latches really aren't what the hardware is designed to do. Uh, don't do logic on a clock line, because this will cause clock skew and all sorts of problems. And everything that you program must be programmed such that it will happen in a single clock cycle each time. You, you, you shouldn't write as if you're programming for a microprocessor because um, you're not. There, there, is, there is no processor for you, to pro for, for you to program for. That's not part of the, part of the tool chain here. There's no... Um, the, the only way that um, the FPGA can run an algorithm is if you describe the, uh, describe the hardware that it will run on to the FPGA. And check the <coughs> RTL viewer at the end to ensure proper synthesis. Anytime you're programming for an FPGA, you should know exactly what your hardware is going to look like. Um, and use templates provided by the manufacturer of the FPGA to um, know what constructs, what uh, coding style you need to use to, um, to to achieve the hardware that you want. So, just, just to show you how this works a little more, uh, this is Cordis. Uh, this is the uh, integrated development environment for Altera FPGAs. Um, it's very clunky, it's very annoying. Uh, the text editor sucks, but um, yeah, this is what you have to use. So um, what I have here is a state machine for controlling the sliding doors on an elevator. <coughs> so if, if you think of maybe an elevator door, you think maybe you have Maybe a reset state, and then from there, depending on what position the, the door happens to be in, it might go to a state where it might go to a state where the door is closing. And after it's finished closing, it might go to a state called closed. And in each case, you have different control signals that you want to send out from the FPGA. Mm -hmm. And firstly, from there, you might add a state called opening. And that goes to a state called open. And uh, You might have transitions uh, between these states, and you might also have a problem. So, so say the elevator door gets stuck on something and the motor breaks. Uh, so you might have a timer that's going, and if it goes for too long before the door closing, uh, being fully open or fully closed, you might have it set off an alarm bell and say the door is broken. So if it stays, you know, in one of those two states too long, you might have an extra state called. Uh, So you, you, you kind of get the idea. Um, so how do I go about doing this in uh, VHDL? So I have my libraries. Uh, I have an entity. Um, and I have the various inputs for the different sensors or outputs. So I have a separate output for, motor, uh, for turning on the motor and for switching its direction. And I also have like an indicator light to say that the door is broken. Um, <clears throat> now, for a state, uh, state machines are very valuable because on an FPGA, unless you use a software processor that you find on opencourse.org or something like that, uh, you're going to have to use a state machine to control whatever you're doing. 
a, a state machine is, ba is the basic uh, is basically the, the, the style of coding that you want to use on an FPGA is a state machine that ties together different uh, different other functions. So when I do a state machine, I have to give a type declaration. Uh, all right, all right. So I'm saying I have a state type. These are the different states, like like you see um, up on the board. Uh, and then I want to have a, a signal called state and a signal called next state. Now, one of the confusing things here is that a signal may not necessarily be a wire. It may also synthesize as a register. And that's what happens in this case. Uh, next state, um, it basically represents the combinational logic that I use to determine what state I should go to next. So when I'm in reset, if reset is zero, it's an active load reset, then I stay in the reset state. <coughs> Otherwise, if uh, the door wants me, if, if whatever's controlling the elevator wants the, wants the door uh, to be open, then I should start op uh, go try to open it. Otherwise, I should try closing it. So, and that gives me a state transition, et cetera. And the nice thing about this is I don't have to, uh, you know, I don't have to do k-maps or anything and figure out, okay, uh, what logic do I need to get from one state to the other. You can just say what transitions you want to make, and the compiler will figure out all of the combination logic for you. So you, sh you should never really have to explicitly say with what exact combination logic you want. Uh, you should just be able to use uh, use a uh, process like this and a case statement, and you can use that to define all your next state logic. Um, so, and then <coughs> here's a slightly different process. Uh, this process is for the counter to me to tell whether or not my elevator door is broken. And you can see I have this, this conditional, uh, this, this if statement here, uh, clock event and clock one. So basically this means do this only if I'm on a rising clock edge. So basically this means that this is going to be the, tra the transition for uh, a register of some kind. Uh, and you might notice I have two different ways of um, setting a, a, a signal or a variable. Uh, so this is only for variables. Uh, a variable can only be used within the process. Uh, signals uh, can be used th throughout an architecture. So if you want to um, do something like a counter that's internal to a process, you should use a variable. Um, it makes things nice and... Uh, you, you keep everything separate. You don't want to define all of this, every single variable that you're going to use in the entire program at the top of the architecture. You want to be able to, to uh, com compartmentalize it a little bit, just to keep things separate, keep things neat and, and understandable. Um, and then finally I have, so I have this process which progresses the state. Um, and again, I, I have this condition that um, basically says this is the transition of a register. And finally, I have my output process. And this is, again, just combination logic. I'm just saying, depending on what state and what inputs I have, these are what I want my outputs to be. And you'll notice that I declare these at the top, that I, I set values to these uh, signals at the top of the process, and then read, uh, give them different values lower down. Uh, 
this is just to give me a default value for each signal. Uh, a, in, in a process, the only value that's kept for a signal is the last one uh, uh, given to it. So if, state, if the current state is broken, then the value of a broken indicator will be one, uh, not zero, because this is farther down. This just, uh, in, in, anytime you assign values to a signal, and an HDL, whether it's Verilog or HDL, you always have to have a default or else you will have a latch because a latch holds its state until, until further notice, basically. Um, so this is very important if you want to make sure that your code synthesizes cleanly into just combination logic and registers because that's all, all the hardware that you have. Those are the only kind, those are the only uh, elements that should exist in your design. So, um, and what I was saying about the RTL viewer, uh, after you compile, which can take an extremely long time using this, I think the longest it's ever taken me to compile a program was about 25 minutes. Uh, that was for a software-defined radio. Operated in the X band range and could do DBBS2 uh, spec. So, uh, and here's another annoying thing. In, in Cordis, if you're if you're doing ultra FPGAs, they'll give you warnings for all the things, all the optional features that you didn't pay for, just to uh, <coughs> make you feel bad about not having bought them. So, half the half the warnings that you get don't mean anything. So you can use this, this nice uh, device called the RTL viewer uh, to see what you built um, on a logical level. Uh, this isn't exactly what the hardware looks like on the FPGA, but um, so as you can see here, I have my state machine. Uh, and of course, it doesn't even show me what combination logic it, it, it used. It just shows me uh, this nice diagram that lets me check that all my state transitions make sense. Um, and that should correspond roughly with this diagram here. Um, and it gives you a list of the conditions for transition at the bottom, uh, state transition at the bottom. Uh, and I also have the counter. So you can see I have a register, I have matter, and I have a mux uh, that will um, uh, load uh, zeros into the register to reset the counter. So um, <clears throat> this makes it very easy to debug because all you do is after you um, write your HDL and you compile it, you can come to the RTL viewer, you can check and make sure everything's connected as you, as you would hope. And then after that, you can run a simulation. Um, this is kind of difficult in all, for Altera products because they don't, for, for various reasons, uh, simulation is really a pain uh, with Altera. But um, you can also write VHDL to run the simulation. So this is just a, 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 this just shows a, a very small subset of the syntax for this. Uh, <coughs> so as you can see, there's you should basically have each process um, inside your architecture either synthesize. Uh, be, be written such that it is synthesized as a big block of combination logic or as a register. And um, you can also, depending on the, on the tool that you're using, use rising edge clock. It doesn't seem to work at this moment. Um, so 
here you can see I'm just giving default values and then I have a case statement for, for assignment. And uh, so it, these are the very basic constructs that you use to, to program in your still instances. Um, so that's pretty much it for The big problem is there's a huge amount of uh, syntax, a huge number of constructs available um, for VHDL. So some things to keep in mind. Um, VHDL is an extremely strongly typed language. And what that means is that you can't do any operation on any variable, any signal. Um, so as, as you might have seen in, in the program I had, standard logic types. I also had uh, integer types. I had state types. Um, there's also unsigned sign types, uh, floating point, weird things, complex numbers. So you have to know which operations you can perform on each type. And uh, a reference is a good, uh, it's very important to keep, uh, to keep a good reference uh, with you when you're programming so you can look up which is which. And if you want to do an operation on a type that you that's not legal, you have to do what's called casting and uh, switch a signal or a variable from one type to another. And uh, this gets kind of complicated and there's no consistent way to do it, so you need a reference for that. Uh, variables versus signals. A variable is local to a process. Uh, a signal uh, goes throughout an architecture. There's also global variables. Uh, however, the, these really aren't often used and they're not synthesizable, so I wouldn't worry about them too much. Uh, standard versus non-standard libraries. I think I, I mentioned that. Stand also, standard versus non-standard packages within a library. Uh, and then make sure you keep track of which syntax is synthesizable versus non-synthesizable. Um, so, and if you keep these things in mind, it'll make it a lot easier to to code in VHDL. So that kind of begs the question. All right. So, so how do, uh, how do I, where do I go from here? So I want to do a project on an FPGA. Where do I start? Where do I get the ideas? Um, well, the first thing, find a good VHDL reference. Um, this is one that I just happened to find online. Uh, it's pretty long. Uh, it has almost all of the constructs that you can use um, and gives you the correct syntax and maybe an example. Uh, so this is very useful as a general reference. Uh, what's also very important is if you're designing for a specific uh, for a specific product, um, which will generally be an Altera or a Xilinx FPGA. Um, each of them has certain preferences. Uh, different syntax will synth may even synthesize differently on a different uh, FPGA, depending on the manufacturer. So if you're trying to write code that will compile correctly and run correctly on any FPGA, any FPGA, you have to do a very delicate balancing act and make sure that uh, your coding style uh, will behave in the same way regardless of which tools you're using. So this is why it's very important. Uh, you can find this page via Google. Um, there are many examples of hardware that you can uh, find the VHDL4 on the Altera website or on the Xilinx website. And this will basically give you a template that you can use for, for um, making your own custom hardware on their FPGAs. So um, I found that this is a very good reference. It's good to have a, a more general language reference. And there's also several forums that are good for learning about um, VHDL. I think EDA board's good, the Altera forums are good, and there are also a few class websites that you can find through Google that are good for them. 
that's pretty much it. Uh, there's there's a lot that can be said, but uh, it's gets a little annoying after the after the basics. So, anyone have any questions? Um, are you going to be posting any of the uh, documents online? Uh, I think I'll, I'll I'll post the link link to the Altera website uh, examples page for HDL and I can probably post this uh, this reference document and the code that I showed. Alright. Uh, so can I have you know what is the a practical application for this language um, to simulation signals or just uh, or, uh, <coughs> constructing the or system or by the signals. Just, uh. So generally, what what VHDL would be used for would be designing for an application specific chip. Uh, digital chip or a or for an FPGA which is more reusable. Uh, you can do you can design almost any digital circuit in VHDL um, and it will run on an FPGA. Uh, for example there are soft core processors that you can write that will run on an FPGA. Uh, this is very useful for, for signal processing, digital signal processing. Uh, you can write modules that will um, that can do various functions in parallel because <coughs> you have pretty much unlimited parallelism on an FPGA as opposed to a processor where everything has to happen sequentially. So you have very tight control over your clocking. Um, you know exactly when everything is going to happen. There, there won't be any other unexpected delays as long as you keep clocking. The FPGA. So you can use this to, to write a custom DSP chip, you can write a custom processor. Uh, if you need to do many calculations very quickly, um, for example, in uh, some newer GPS models, uh, in order to establish lock with satellites, they may use uh, an FPGA to run through all the possible pseudo-random bit sequences to, to, to get lock with the um, with, with the uh, satellites transmissions. So, um, and and again, if you're designing people who design processors, uh, any any chip really, even even memory, sometimes will will simulate it on uh, will use VHDL to write a simulation that they can then test extensively before they commit anything to silicon. Um, if you really get into uh, the language, you can even, uh, VHDL has the ability to simulate certain analog circuits. Um, it can be used in conjunction with SPICE. Uh, <coughs> it gets very complicated, but it, it's possible to do a lot. And it's also very good for system level design because uh, VHDL is much more scalable than Verilog. So, all right. Thanks a lot.